episode 22 of After the Breach, a podcast for whale enthusiasts. We're your hosts, Jeff Friedman and Sarah Shimazu. We are both professional whale watching captains and guides with Maya's Legacy Whale Watching in Friday Harbor on San Juan Island, Washington. Joining us again to follow up a bit from our last episode is April Ryan, who's also a professional whale watching captain and guide with Maya's Legacy. The three of us are still in Bremer Bay. And we are still going out on the water most days. There is so much to cover, and we really need to get this a bit organized. But in the meantime, we wanted to share some stories with you and not leave you hanging for too long and also be able to recount some of this information while it's still fresh in our minds. So we're going to, each of us are just going to talk a little bit about some of the highlights of, of what we've seen here. And I think we should start with Sarah. Thanks, Jeff. Oh, you're the I'm best. here. I'm here for you. Yeah. Well, you're the, you're the furthest away from the mic right now, so I figured it would be good to get you back over <laughs> this direction. All right, man. It's hard to pick just one thing that has been amazing in this this month here in Bremer Bay. Fourth time here for me, and I think one of the things I've just been thinking about. It's not a particular moment, and maybe I'll come up with one as I'm saying this, but. The thing that has stuck out to me the most this month is that it's completely different from what I was expecting in that last January we saw specific groups of whales and it just felt kind of like quote unquote the norm like this is what it was going to be you know even the crew on board was like yeah these are the whales that we see in January we see them regularly in January. And this year has been different. And there's been a ton of new whales that we've seen. Family groups that are usually here on a daily basis. We just saw for the first time in the last couple of days. Uh, So it's just been so different with what whales have been present. How they've been moving through, you know, the, the habitat. Pushing these beaked whales kind of up onto the shelf during some of the predations that we've seen. It's just been really, really cool. Um to kind of like throw out my expectations for that. So I really appreciate that the whales whales have done that for well not for me, but for themselves, but I've just been privy to it. Well, and, and very cool. We talked about this in episode 21. Man, those v- birds are going crazy. Yeah, we got lots of birds, uh lots of I think honey eaters going in in and out of the tree. So if you hear that in the background, they're just extra guests. Uh, special guests. But we did mention in episode 21 and very cool to see undocumented whales uh while we were here yeah and we've seen more since since that episode just the other day we had three new whales uh that like machi has seen in 2019 so it's been five years since she's seen them last um but there was a new calf among them so we got to see baby comet for the first time and uh older siblings sedna and then hallie mom new names new calf some of these whales named for the first time yeah and the process down here is really different from how it is back home and there are a few different processes back home but here um because there are just a few people out there regularly kind of accounting for these whales and keeping track of them they really assign names and so they try to kind of do it as we some of us try to do it back home um keeping kind of a theme for a family so uh, the calf, one of the, the marine biologists wanted to name it Comet. And so we went with a planetary theme for the family. So Hallie, named for Hallie's Comet, for the mom. And then Sedna, which is kind of dual name, and we have a whale back home named Sedna as well, uh, is a name of a dwarf planet, but also the name of the Inuit goddess of the sea and marine animals. So it kind of fits in two ways with that. Very cool. Yeah, it's a, it's a much more direct and expedited process here. April, this is your very first time here, like we talked about on the last episode. Give us one of your big takeaways or like a moment that really stands out. And a lot of this stuff that we're talking about, we're going to flesh this out in more detail as we go further into the next one or two episodes, because we really want to get into detail on some of the, the stuff. But What's something that really just stands out to you? The big thing is, for me, I keep seeing it over and over with these predation events, is you might be with anywhere from three to six whales, and the next thing you know, there's a predation going on, 
and there are whales coming from every direction and you can end up with 30 to 40 whales and why is that possibly because there is so much open water they're you know working the canyon system until somebody says oh yeah we got one over here and how they're communicating across all of those miles of vast ocean i'm i'm finding it very impressive that they are working together in these groups of anywhere starting at 20 easily 30 and sometimes 40 whales all coming together with their families uh it's like a big old barbecue we had that yesterday we were, were with two whales started with three started with in three taddy's group and yeah. then uh and very very uh, they were patrolling very long we were I think we were clocking them at nine or ten minute dives. Yeah, they're very stealthy, low profile, only a couple here and there. And, and then all of a sudden, there, there are six of them together. Yeah, six in a line. Could have easily gone into a resting line. and But no. No. No rest. No. It was on to the, to the hunt because it, it had to be three to five miles away easily where the hunt was going on. Yeah. And they started surging in that direction and then we were out there there were probably somewhere around 40 whales and I don't know how many hundreds of shearwaters and many albatross uh, big big feast yeah several different species of albatross and they were taking big chunks one flew off with a huge chunk another one grabbed a chunk and just inhaled it pretty much um, and the shearwaters were taking as much as they could I think one of the other things that is impressive to me, and I know this, we we all know this, right, is how fast (laughs) it can go from a full living fleeing whale into a chunk of spine that the kids are playing tug of war with. Like it is so fast sometimes how quickly they can break down such a large animal. Yeah. I mean, you're absolutely right because it went from this very condensed group of whales on a still living beaked whale and within minutes you had them spread out and split up into these little groups where they all were prey sharing yeah they all had food one of the guides was thinking that they possibly got a mom and her calf but when you have 30 or 40 individuals working together it goes really fast and it was overwhelming the number of birds that were that were out there Oh, yeah. um, I've never seen that many shearwaters or albatross in one one place at one time. It was yeah. incredible. Yeah, it was the most that we've ever seen. The other highlight from from that, and we'll again we'll get into details, and we've got some photos and and video to post in the show notes. But there was afterwards, um, and April and Sarah, you both got great shots of this. There was a little play group of kids that w- it was almost like they were playing keep away, but they they wanted to include us and let us know what they were doing and they brought a, a the spinal column yeah very close and keep away tug of war capture the flag all what? of the above hard to say yeah but they were they were clearly playing yeah they were they were having a good time it appeared i'll jump in with a uh, I, I have a hard time nailing down one takeaway or one highlight one not highlight since since the last episode was um, we did have another surge event with whales surging on where last time we talked it was a 20 knot surge into 20 knot winds into two meter swells. But you got just as wet this time, Jeff. I did. And it was like calm water, sunny skies, very little wind. And I think there was only one person on the boat that got soaked and during the surge and there was one wave that came over the port side of the boat and it came right at me (laughs) and april and sarah were on the other side of the boat and then i was downstairs again (laughs) well i came up and around the corner and you looked at me and you're like again yeah and well that april came up and she she looked at me she's like again (laughs) so yeah i did get soaked again that was not a highlight but the, uh, the two the big takeaways, and I, I want to get it really in into this in depth at 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 some point on a, an episode coming up. One is we did see a predation, a beach whale predation, um, after we were with a small group of whales that were patrolling, and then a bunch of whales came in, and this was not a surge. 
this was a much, it was still quick, but it wasn't what we've seen in, in terms of surging where we see spread out whales all surging to the same location. This was a very compact group of two or three dozen killer whales. Yeah. Powerful, but in a different way. Exactly. In formation, a tight formation. And it, and the things that stand out at first were like, okay, something's changed, but we don't know what's going on until one of the crew shouts out a beaked whale just surfaced 100 meters ahead of them. And so it was, they were going, they must have heard the beaked whale coming up from the depths to, to get some breaths. And it was a powerful thing to witness, to see this formation of, you know, 30 to 40 killer whales. Uh, Sarah you, and April, you got some great shots. I got some video. We'll post that. But it was one of the, just as I was taking video and watching it through the lens, um, it didn't get lost on me what I was actually shooting. And it was just, it was one of the biggest wow moments I've ever had on the water with any whales to see. I've never seen anything like that before. It was so tight, like a resting line, but with that many whales and not resting and lots of time at the surface and this, uh, incredible chase that, that, you know, ended up obviously in, in a predation. Yeah. I think, one of the and there's so many things from that encounter that stand out to me and one was this kind of contrast between seeing animals that we see on a daily basis doing something that i i've not seen them in that formation before um so seeing animals that we're really familiar with doing something unfamiliar um not unfamiliar but just differently than we're we're used to to us and then seeing an animal that is so unfamiliar to us. Like I have seen a handful of beaked whales in my time here and I had never seen a strap tooth beaked whale before. So like being excited to see a beaked whale, but then knowing that like I'm seeing this in its final moments, you know, was really kind of like a striking thing for me in that, in that encounter. I've never seen beaked whales before this. And yeah, I, I would like to see, a beaked whale or a group of beaked whales and be able to stop and appreciate them for who they are where they're not being hunted. Right. I'd love to, to see them. I know they're difficult to see because they don't spend much time at the surface and they go down for hours and come up for a few minutes and then they're gone again, but it would be cool to see a, a group of them. Yeah. This is probably the, not the circumstance they <laughs> want to be seen. No. no, it's, it's no. definitely not an easy thing to see, especially that slow, Deliberate Metho chase. Yeah, deliberate and, methodical. And yeah, the beaked whale is up ahead and you really feel it in your gut. You're like, okay, he, he's trying to get enough breaths to get back down. And you just, you know, it's like, it's not going to happen. No. And every once in a while, you'll, you'll see evidence that there are whales deeper because you see that the water clarity is amazing and you can see white flashes from either their eye patches or their bellies. So, you know. Yeah, they're cutting off his path. And, you know, you can't help wonder what's going through his mind. I mean, you just, you, you, you've got to, I mean, it's, it's human nature to start thinking about that. And it's, it's not the easiest thing to see, but it is, it is impressive for, to see the apex predator and, and see how they really did get their name killer whales. Yeah. The other thing that I have to add in, it's such a big takeaway and we will talk more about this is it's one of the big differences and there's so many differences in the whale culture down here and the whale watching culture. And we're going to get into a lot more with both of those. We've gotten very used to at home when we see killer whales that whether it's deliberate or whether we're just incidentally in the direction that they choose to turn into and killer whales get near our boats because of the environment that we're in the political environment it's what I've gotten really clear on on this trip is when killer whales come up to our boat, it's like, all right, everybody play dead, turn off the motors, everybody be quiet, like just wait, wait till they're gone, pretend we're not even here. And it's very different here. And I think because of that, I think killer whales approach the boats and people more and 
they really seem to be getting something out of the interactions. And the reason that I'm saying that is one of the highlights uh, on one of the days we had uh, multiple visits from whales close to the boat and people put GoPros in the boat, in the water. And the whales really seemed to uh, enjoy that to the point where they kept coming back both when the GoPro was put into the water, they would come back and then they would come back sometimes when the GoPro wasn't in the water and they would just hang out there until the GoPro was put in the water. Uh, yeah. And, and this isn't, they came back a couple of times or he came in three or four times. Jeff and I put our cameras down for two hours and whatever video we took was on our iPhones. Yeah. We were, our, our good cameras were in the cabin and we were in the back of the boat just watching whales repeatedly come in and, and they were, po- pose for photos from the GoPro in the water yeah. and what they're clearly, they're getting something from it. But what is it? Who what knows? What is it? Who knows? And there was, a, there was one male who was doing it repeatedly for hours who we were able to identify that was the same whale that did this for hours uh, last year. Um, and we were able to identify him because uh, he, he smiled for the camera <laughs> and uh, has a missing tooth. Um, not, a, not a broken tooth or a worn down tooth. It is completely missing because you can see in the photos from, from both days of those encounters where it's a... a there's a, a socket there's a, a, and an there's salty socket. flesh there. And, yeah. But clearly there, and we'll, I'll post some video um, in the show notes that is so like so different from what we do uh, in the Pacific Northwest. And we wouldn't do this in the, in the Pacific Northwest, but clearly the whales are enjoying it and they're getting something from it and they're totally safe in these kind of interactions. And the video is amazing. This was iPhone video where the whale comes, they put GoPro behind the boat, the whale comes up, uh, belly up at the surface and then oh, there was one that we both got and it may have been different occasions because he did it so many times but he comes up along the side of the boat spins you turn upside down yeah and following the boat I it, mean so yeah, cool. just right behind the boat yeah. with the GoPro in the water really really incredible and uh, that was that very cool to see but also uh, just a very big difference in terms of the, what the whales are doing here and what whale watching is doing here. And it's all, it's all great. It's just very different and very eye opening um, as to who, who these whales really are um, and the uniqueness of, of this population. Yeah. Getting to see that personality is pretty amazing. So we are going to, we wanted to share a couple quick stories, but we are going to go in depth on the differences in the culture, both of whale watching um, and this incredibly unique culture of, of killer whales. Uh, I think when we came down here, um, we kind of felt like, I mean, a big takeaway for me, I felt like, oh, we know killer whales because we know our the populations that we see. We know them so well. And then coming, and we knew that, that yes, all killer whale populations have their own cultures. But I think the biggest takeaway of any is, yeah, we we don't know anything about different cultures until until we do, but they're all really different. Very unique, very unique. So, yeah, exactly what you said, and we've talked about this kind of a, a lot in the last week, week and a half, is just kind of throwing out this, like, quote-unquote box that we have of knowledge with the, you know, Southern resident with the bigs, the Southern residents being, you know, arguably the most studied population of killer whales in the world. Um, you know, Northern residents as well. Just, I feel like sometimes it's easy to think that what we've learned from them could apply, you know, in whole to any other population of killer whale. And it's just not the case. We, we know that from back home, just from looking at the differences between the Southern residents and, and the big killer whales, that that's not the case. And, and visiting a completely different population of offshore, deep, deep water inhabiting killer whales just kind of drives that point home that, you know, we can use that as a baseline we can consider that but that we really shouldn't be expecting these whales to act the same as as the killer whales that we're used to 
and just to be open to the differences that they're going to show us in observing them. Yeah, a- absolutely. It's everything is different here in terms of how many whales are traveling together, mul- probably multiple family groups. We don't know exactly how they're related. Their behaviors are totally different. They're, somebody emailed us. We got an email and asked if their hunting techniques are similar to the whales off of California when they're hunting gray whales. And it's like, it's completely different. Everything is different. These are, this is a unique culture, unique behaviors, uh, unique hunting techniques. Everything is, is totally unique to this population. Just like the bigs are unique to the bigs. The Southern residents are unique to the Southern residents and the Southern residents and the Northern residents are very different from each other in terms of their culture and, and the way they travel and, and what they do. Yeah, so you want to see all of them. You want to see southern residents. You want to see northern residents. You want to come out and see these whales. It is a long haul. It takes a huge investment of your time and energy. For me, it's worth it. It's absolutely worth it, but it is a big commitment to get here. It's not easy to get here, and there really isn't a whole lot going on here outside of, of at least for us with the, the killer whales, there's really no town uh it does make friday harbor look like manhattan no if you want to see what this town looks like look up a little town in north dakota called rame north dakota (laughs) yeah it's 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 tiny there's a few hundred people who live here right that's exactly right two gas stations two restaurants a cafe and a couple of places for breakfast on the weekends yeah, and there is a there is a pharmacy, post office, electronic store, oh, yeah. <laughs> and community hall that are all in the same place. And you can get postcards there. Yes. So we're we're going to come back and and go into a lot more depth. But the last point I just wanted to cap on this different culture and and how these whales are all these populations of killer whales are so different is how can we study and do research on one population and publish a paper on one population and say this applies to killer whales you can't no you can't you can't do a study on northern residents and say oh because of this we need to do this around bigs right and i think if you talk to the people doing the research they know that right they're doing a specific research on a specific population and and hopefully most of them realize how different each population can be but it's something that's important for you know everyone that's just likes killer whales right that is interested in learning more about killer whales it's important for policymakers to know it's important for ngos and other other organizations that are working in killer whale recovery, whether it's here, whether it's back home, whether it's anywhere in the world. Um, This is an important thing to know. Absolutely. These are unique populations with unique uh, social constructs, unique behaviors, unique cultures, and they need to be treated as, as such. But we'll get into all of that and more. Um, This is just a quick, just a a quick update from us down here in Bremer Bay and, yeah thanks for tuning in it's been a long but great month and we're excited for our last couple of days on the water here a couple more days on the water and we're going to share lots more with you but we also wanted to touch base to make sure that you guys stay safe out there